Welcome to Cannabis Conversations. I am your host, Nancy Nurge, adult nurse practitioner and certified provider by Connecticut to authorize the use of medical marijuana. The views and ideas expressed here are mine and in no way are meant to diagnose or treat any condition. I only work with primary care providers, specialists to serve my patients with regards to the use of medical marijuana. Please allow me to do introduce myself. I have been an adult nurse practitioner for over 10 years in Connecticut. My background is working with my patients in their homes from wellness visits, chronic disease management, through to hospice. During that time, I have developed a passion to find alternative treatments to help my patients deal with the challenges of inflammation, pain, and anxiety. My patients' goals were generally simple, get a good night's sleep, wake up and live life to the fullest. I've heard two things specifically. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I am too young to feel this old. My goal is how can I help my patients without adding another pill, achieve a good night's sleep, reduce pain, and control their anxiety. That's when I discovered the medical marijuana program in Connecticut. My goals for this presentation are to share with you the history of marijuana. I want you to understand the cannabis plant and its interaction with the human body. And most important, how and why cannabis can help you. I truly feel that knowledge leads to wellness. So what is the history? What is marijuana? The word marijuana, believe it or not, is a derogatory slang for the bud portion of the cannabis plant. Technically, the plant is called cannabis. It's one of the oldest psychoactive substance used by man today. And it's one of the most controversial, misunderstood, and unfortunately vilified plants in history. How did it become so bad? Well, my opinion, it was about greed and control. For most of recorded history, cannabis has been an accepted and widely used as medicine. Cannabis use in ancient Egypt has been recorded as, back as far as back as 2000 BC. It was found in the scrolls. It was documented in ancient Egypt to treat sore eyes and cataracts. According to Greek history, Egyptian women use cannabis as a medication to receive, to relieve sorrow and bad humor. Cannabis was found in many of the mummies of Ramesses of the Egyptian thing. Additional research has linked cannabis pollen to royal mummies. Use of cannabis is found throughout the Bible. The Spanish brought cannabis to the Americas in the mid-1500s, and English introduced it at Jamestown in 1611, where it became a popular commercial crop alongside tobacco. For most of the United States history, cannabis has held great esteem by medical professions for its medicinal benefits. Connecticut has had a long history of growing hemp for industrial purposes. Starting in the, the 1920s, cannabis immediately received backlash from the U.S. government, primarily because of race-based fears that um, Mexican immigrants were coming across the U.S. border and bringing cannabis with them. At this time, there was a lot of propaganda surrounding cannabis. It was, incite it was associated with inciting violence and crime and even referred to as evil weed. The end of prohibition brought the introduction of the Drug Enforcement Agency. And while parts of the government could not control alcohol, they could make heroin, cocaine, and marijuana illegal. The final death knife was delivered by the Controlled Substance Act in 1970, making cannabis illegal and classifying it as a scheduled one drug. Scheduled one drugs are drugs that are deemed highly addictive and have no medical benefit. The challenge with cannabis is it only works as cannabis. The plant with all the known and unknown components, 
That's what makes it so frustrating for drug companies. They have been unable to make the synthetics, to patent it, to work as well as the real thing. In my first slide, I've broken cannabis down into three ways that you may have heard of. The first is medical, the second is street, and the third is hemp. Medical marijuana that's grown in Connecticut is pharmaceutical grade cannabis, grown under very strict regulations, harvested, extracted, and tested, meeting some of the highest standards of the industry. The second is street pot. This is illegal, and honestly, you have no idea what you're getting. Third is hemp, or what is being currently sold over the counter as CBD. I am gonna devote a whole show to understanding hemp-based CBD, but for this presentation, let's differentiate it with the cannabis with very little THC, and that's the portion of the plant that can get you high. My presentation is also only going to deal with information on medical grade cannabis in Connecticut. What are the types of plants? Here we see the two largest types of plants, which are indica and sativa. How I remember these back to my nursing days is indica is in bed meaning that it has much more sedative qualities. And I remember sativa by sit up. Sativa can be generally more energizing. While knowing this is important, most plants have evolved into hybrids. These are combinations and plants where they're grown with regards to the percentages of cannabinoids that are in the plants. Plants' genetics can also play a large role in the effects people will experience when they consume it. Sediva-dominant hybrids tend to be more upliving, uplifting, while indica-dominant strains re are more relaxing. Sediva versus indica plants only paint a partial picture of the strain's effect. However, it is important to look at the ratio of the THC and CBD and the lesser known cannabinoids such as CBG, CBC, and THV, as well as what called terpenes in the plant. These all play a role in how the hybrid strain works. Having a knowledge of these factors can help consumers choose an ideal strain. Even so, it can be difficult to know what effects a hybrid will produce before consuming it to find out. The best policy when trying any new strain is to chart with a small amount and consume very slowly. But how does it work? Well, let's talk about those components I talked about. The first two components that we're gonna talk about are THC. THC, now you ready for this word? Tetrahydrocannabinol is probably the best known chemical compound found in marijuana. This compound is responsible for the euphoric and psychoactive effect of the plant and such is the most sought after component for recreational users. Apart from its recreational effects, THC has a wide array of applications as medicine. It is often used to ease the pain and nausea that comes with cancer treatments and help with the management of chronic pain. Newer studies have also shown that it may be able to delay the progression of ALS as well as ease the painful symptoms of multiple sclerosis. CBD or cannabidiol has become nearly well as known as THC these days, largely due to CBD's effectiveness as a medicine. One of the main benefits as a treatment is that it is not psychoactive, making it more appealing to a greater number of patients than THC. CBD acts as an anti-inflammatory, antipsychotic, and it can also help with nausea. The compound is already being used to treat arthritis, mood disorders, and has shown great potential in aiding cancer treatments. 
considering there are over 400 compounds unique to the cannabis plant, these two only scratch the surface. With greater access to the plant and the ability to conduct proper studies, we will be able to learn more about the chemistry of cannabis and what to expect with regards to medical purposes we can use it for. Now we're gonna talk about what does it work on? Most of us know about nicotine receptors in the brain. That's where nicotine interacts and causes euphoria in the brain, and it becomes highly addictive. With regards to the body, we have an endocannabinoid system in the body. The endocannabinoid system is a communication system that is important and it was first identified in 1980. It is named for the cannabis plant. The ECS evolves, involves the entire body. It plays a key role in crea creating and keeping wellness. It affects our organs, immune system, and nervous system. By understanding this system, we be begin to see a mechanism that could connect brain activity and states of physical health and disease. Within the ECS, there are two receptors. There's CBD1, and those are found primarily in the brain and spinal cord, and CBD2. Those receptors are found primarily throughout the body. In our body, ECS keeps us at a baseline function, or what we call homeostasis. Our bodies like to remain in a healthy state, but the daily events and challenges of life can be stressful. The ECS registers when a certain body system responds to stress or injury by going into a higher gear that can strain its resources. So the ECS is activated manufacturing endocannabinoids. Yes, your body actually has the ability to produce its own cannabinoids. That ultimately return the body to its baseline state in which all parts are working together in harmony. Thus, our internal cannabinoids help us survive quickly an increasingly hostile environment. Medical, medical cannabis with THC, CBD, and the other compounds work with the ECS to bring the body back into balance. That's where the beauty is. CBD in the body. Creates what's known as the entourage effect. Cannabis and all its components work and all its components work on all the systems to bring us back to a state of well-being. This is where plant meets the body. Here we see how cannabis works on a system within the body and all the benefits. It works on the nervous system. It can relax us, reduce anxiety, and can actually be responsible for anti-seizures. In our digestive system, it will work with the contractions of the small intestines. I really appreciate that for all of my patients who have Crohn's or IBS. On the muscle skeletal system, it can produce bone growth. It works with the bones, muscle tension relief, and reduce inflammation. The circular system, which is something we're just finding out about, it can, have, it can be anti-extemic and raise uh, cerebral blood flow. The whole body protection, it can fight free radicals and stop cancer growth. All of these things that it's doing with regards to our whole body. One of the biggest questions I get is with regards to dosing. There is no formulary for dosing cannabis. It's not like I give you a script and you go down to CVS and fill it with so many milligrams once a day. This is truly the beginning of personal medicine. First, you have a plant with all of its properties. Then you have you with your history, genetics, and just as your fingerprints are unique to, you, are unique to you, so is your body, and how you will react to cannabis is your personal profile. My advice is start low and go slow. This is your body, you will be finally in control. 
The next slide talks about how you can take it. Most of us know about smoking. The issue with smoking is a lot of people don't want to do it. It still is the most popular of the routes to do, and it still is one of the most effective because your lungs absorb cannabis really well and bring it right into your system. The second one is to vaporize it. Now I know vaping pens have gotten a lot of bad press lately, but I just want you to realize that vaping is an excellent way to ingest cannabis and the, the vaping issues that they're having have to do with, the, none of those have to do with those that are sold by the dispensaries. Tincture is probably one of the biggest um, in my market with the, with the elderly um, because you can put it right under your tongue and just like anything else, it's absorbed really quickly there. It goes to work in about 20 minutes and can last up to two hours. Edibles are very good too. They have the tendency to be the longest lasting. The challenge we have with edibles has to do with, they can take longer to interact with your body. So one of my challenges is to tell my patients to try some and put it away because you don't wanna be trying it until up to two hours later. Edibles can take between two, 20, 30 minutes and two hours to start. So like people, you'll see them pop a brownie or something like that and not think that it worked and they'll pop another one and then all of a sudden we've got a bigger rush than you wanted to go with. Um, uh. Oral ingestion with regards to capsules um, are probably one of the easiest, but you have to recognize that those two have to go through your stomach, through the liver, and into your body. So they have some drawbacks that way about the amount that is lost during what we call the GI pass, or making it from your body to your bloodstream. Topical for my market is great. It can immediately reduce the pain and inflammation on in local areas such as hands and joints. My arthritis patients love this to ease their joint pain. Some final thoughts, overdosing. No one has ever died from cannabis overdosing. No other medication can say that. You may feel dramatic effects and have a really good night's sleep, but cannabis will not kill you. Again, start low and go slow. This presentation is in no way a complete understanding of cannabis, but an introduction. It's about allowing people access to what I believe is the future of pain, inflammation, and anxiety management. The research is coming that uh, is effective on re reducing neuro neuropathic pain, seizures, and many other symptoms patients suffer. So what did we go over? Cannabis has been around for a really long time and it truly has medicinal benefits. The strains, indica, in bed for calming, and sativa, sat up, and hybrids are not as important as knowing the percentage of the cannabinoids such as THC and CBD. You met your endocannabinoid system, and you know that your body produces cannabinoids. Cannabis can support this system and bring you back to balance. We also know how cabinet cannabis can it, we know that how cannabis affects you and your system is individual to you. You know to start low and go slow. If you want more information, education, two websites that I recommend are Leafy, and that's L-E-A-F-L-Y dot com, and Healer dot com, H-E-A-L-E-R dot com. These are in no way all good, all the good information of the sites out there, just two I have found helpful. What does the future hold? First, we must work with the government to get cannabis off a scheduled one drug. Research has shown that it is not highly addictive and it does have medical benefits. This would allow for the number one thing we need, which is more research. 
I want you to, I want to thank you for coming and I want you to stay tuned for part two. Part two is going to focus on the Connecticut medical marijuana program, how to um, apply for it, what qualifies, and what to expect with regards to do that. Two quick questions I got came in were, is cannabis a gateway drug? In some ways it is. It's a gateway off of all the medications we have been told that are highly addictive and are not producing the results. Medical marijuana is not, and it will produce the results. The other challenge some of my patients have is they say, I don't want to get high. Well, going back to that THC and CBD balance, when you balance those two, the effect is not that of getting high. Well, I want to thank you. I appreciate your time. I hope you found this informative. This has been From My Heart, and I want you to stay around and stick around for uh, cannabis, too. Thank you.